how many of you guys have a YouTube channel? If I could see a show of hands. Okay. How many of you have uh, a channel with subscribers less than 1,000? Okay. Maybe less than, more than 1,000, but less than 10,000? Okay. More than 10,000? Awesome. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. That helps me with the uh, kind of seeing who the audience is. So um, thank you for coming to how to streamline your video production process. So we're going to go kind of uh, a lot of this is going to be high level, but at the same time, I like to go a little bit tactical into the nuts and bolts of how I create videos. Uh, but before we get into that, let me give you a quick background about myself. If, uh, if you've never um, seen my channel or who know, I, who, uh, know who I am. So a former soldier turned finance director, uh, raised on the West Coast, I'm a pro product of the University of California system. I went to UC Irvine for undergrad, UCLA for grad school. Uh, so that's kind of like my last 20 years. But what's more important to me um, is my family. So I've been married to my wife. Uh, she's not here today for 12 years. I have two young kids, 10 and 7. Uh, and they were the, one of the big reasons why I wanted to start this YouTube channel because I wanted the uh, kind of, you know, that lifestyle freedom, the lifestyle business. Uh, so uh, what the YouTube channel has allowed me to do is spend more time on, like, coaching my son's soccer team and then, you know, be a certified uh, social media influencer in my mid-40s. So <laughs> um, the dream, right? All right. So how am I doing right now? Uh, so I have a channel called Financial Tortoise. Slow and steady wins the race. That's kind of the mantra of the channel. Uh, right now, I'm about 125,000 subscribers. So it's enough where I'm getting enough uh, subscribers and views for me to sustain a, you know, uh, what do you call it, uh, maintain a uh, nice overhead. However, uh, this is only where I am today. So if we wind the clock back two years ago, uh, September of 2021, I had 25 subscribers and I was getting 11 views per video. So I remember being here two years ago. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And I remember actually talking to a lot of the influencers or a lot of the uh, YouTubers um, who were much more successful at the time. And then I remember they were subscribing. They saw my channel. And they're like, oh, how cute, 25 subscribers. So they would subscribe. I would actually see them like, on my channel. I'm like, yes, like a 26, 27. <laughs> um, so that was two years ago. So how did I go from, so what I want to talk about today is my journey on how I went from 25 subscribers to currently where I am today. So I'm sure you've seen uh, this before with a lot of YouTubers talking about kind of their journey, right? So this was where I was at uh, September 2021, two years ago. Like I said, I had 25 subscribers getting about, you know, 11 views, 15 views on a nice day, you know, 20 if it's going crazy. Um, so that was what it was for a while, as you can see from the graph. Uh, this is today, October 2023, about two years later. And what I like to talk about is this period right here. And I like to call this the grind. This is the grind. This is the uphill. Um, so what you see here is the output, right, the views. This is where we spend a lot of our time looking at the views and being discouraged by the fact that we're not getting you know, any kind of traction. But what I was really focused on during this time, which is hard to do, was to focus on the input. So what I committed myself to do when I, uh, from September uh, until now to po uh, was to post two videos a week. Rainer, rain, uh, uh, what do you, what's the term? Rain or shine. Uh, whatever happens for the, for the week, or if you know, going away for vacation, it doesn't matter. I'm going to post two videos a week for the next uh, you know, foreseeable future. So that's what I did. I didn't focus on the view. I mean, I, of course I look at the views. We all look at the views, right? And we all, get, we all get discouraged. I told myself I'm not gonna look at it, I keep looking at it. But at least what I told myself was, you know, I'm gonna focus on the input, two videos a week. And I feel like this is where a lot of creators, um, I think, uh, have a hard time. Because when you're not seeing that result, it's easy to burn out. Um, and what I want to, what really helped me was to streamline the process of creating the videos as much as possible to remove the friction, to remove the, um, the barrier to creating the videos. Because, you know, scripting, idea generation, filming, editing, it's, it's, it could take, you know, weeks. Like my first video, I think, took me a week to edit. And there was like a three-minute video. 
Um, so I have to kind of figure out how do I remove the friction? How do I make this process, you know, sustainable and enjoyable at the same time? So that's what I want to kind of get into today. All right. So a quote to motivate us: Your task is not to optimize one. Your task is to optimize one system after another, not careen through the day randomly taking care of whatever problems are rubbed. So it's not about you know just kind of going through. Let me film a video today because I feel like it, but creating a system where we can sustain constantly creating uh, videos uh, so that we're pushing them out on a regular basis. All right, number one tip, always be writing content ideas. When you're first starting out, the ideas in your head, you're like, oh, I have so many video ideas. After 50 videos in, you start running out of ideas. So what you have to do is get in the habit of always writing down content ideas. And this for me, like, I, you know, I'll be in the shower, and then like my wife see me like run out the shower because I'm like, oh, I got an idea. Like, let, me, let me borrow your phone, I gotta text myself because I have this video idea because I'm gonna lose it. So you always wanna be writing ideas. Um, and you probably heard of this too. Out of the 100 ideas you write, maybe two are okay, right? You, at, at the time you get the idea, you're like, this is great. And you look at him, you're like, oh my goodness, like why did I even think of this idea? You know, like, this is horrible. Uh, however, creativity is less a fleeting moment of inspiration a, and more a muscle that can be trained through consistent exercise. So more you come up with ideas, better your ideas get. So quantity is the game here. Initially, you want to push for quantity. And then I think once you get more and more, then I think we can, it becomes more refined into better quality. So uh, whether you're showering, whether you're going for the walk, whether you're laying in bed, I have like a note card next to my, uh, uh, my bed where you know, as I'm about to go to sleep, I come up with an idea, or like I gotta, I gotta write it down. So I try to always write down a list of ideas and then this is just a sample of, um, like I have a, a Google spreadsheet where I list out all my ideas and then literally right now, I mean, it's, there's probably like 500 on there. Like 480 are like worthless. Like I look at them and they're like, this is, this is horrible. But in order to get those 20 good ones, it took me 500 to get there. So that's tip number one. Always be writing ideas down. Tip two, and this is, uh, I think for different YouTubers have a different take on this, but I personally like to script word for word. Um, there's so much that goes into filming, the whole video production process. Um, and I feel like the content itself uh, is really the core of how well your video does or not. People can, you, you know, I'm sure you've seen videos where like the editing is amazing, there's a lot of jazz, there's a lot of movements, but then you watch and you're like, you feel a little bit empty. And I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that like the actual core of the content, there was, it, was, it wasn't, at, it was a bit empty. And I think that's why in order to produce the best content possible. Uh, I can't just kind of riff in front of the camera. Like I have to like write everything down word for word, even like the awkward pause and the jokes, awkward jokes. Like I write them all down. Um, Stephen Pressfield, the trick to writing or any creative endeavor, endeavor is that once you start, good things begin to happen. You can't explain it, you don't know why. And the energy field is created by your love, your will, your devotion, your sweat. Trust it, be brave. So for me, I didn't realize when I started YouTube channel that most of my time is going to be spent on writing. I feel like I'm more of a writer than actually a content creator. And then I feel like more I write, better my videos get because more of those ideas are generating in my head, more I'm, you know, it, it's able to process through it and I'm able to produce really quality content. So um, what I do here, as you can see, like this is uh, just a sample of the different scripts I have and then just to give you kind of a general rule of thumb, like a 10 minute video is about 2,500 words. Um, if you wanna do like, and then on YouTube, if you don't go over eight minutes, then you don't get the additional ad revenue because they don't put the mid roll. So I try to aim for at least 10 minutes. So I always aim for about 2,500 words, 2,500 to 3,000 words. And that's a lot. So like, just to give you an example, it takes me probably good like, five hours total to write a 3,000 word. If you think about it, it's like a blog post that you're working on. But yeah, my, my recommendation is that like, you know, if you want to, uh, it, and I think this gets better with time, but for me what's really worked is being able to articulate my thoughts on paper and being able to script everything out word for word. All right, tip number three. So I get some questions regarding thumbnails. 
Um, and this is one of those creative components of YouTube. How do you create good thumbnails? Way, uh, and I've done this before where for each video, I try to think of like a really creative thumbnail, but then after about 50 videos, you burn out because you're like, oh, I, I just, it took me forever to film this video and now I've got to think of a thumbnail. And what's helped me to really streamline the process is to batch shoot all my thumbnails. So it could feel a little awkward if you're like, it's like being a model. You gotta like spend a whole day, you know, getting yourself ready, getting my hair ready. And then literally like you, you just pose it, it, in front of the camera and take like multiple photos in different angles. You know, you've seen those guys on YouTube, they're like pointing at this, pointing at this, like surprise, you know, like pointing this way, looking down, looking up, like everything. Everything you could think of, do it all. And then I, I retake these photos like every few months or so. But then what this really helps is once you've done the scripting, once you've done the filming, when it, comes to, uh, when, when it comes to doing the thumbnail, you don't have to restart it. You don't have to set up the camera, set up the angle, and all of that. You have a batch of photos that you can go to. And sometimes I, f I re retake the photos if, if I have like a new idea that I want to do. But then this helps you to have a database in which you can kind of pull from. So this is like my old ones. Um, and then this is like more of my recent ones. And I have like literally like hundreds of these. It's kind of awkward like when you're first time doing it. You feel, and then you have to do it yourself and um, setting up the lighting, all of that. But uh, it really like helps to streamline the process. All right, checklist. I'm a huge fan of checklists. There's actually a book called Checklist by Atul Gwanda. It's, uh, I would highly recommend it. Under conditions of complexity, not only are checklists a help, they are required for success. So like the whole video filming process, if you guys done it, there's a lot that goes there, right? Like you have to get all the equipment out, you have to make sure the camera is set up in the right way, you have to make sure the angle is correct, you have to make sure the script is correct, and there's a lot of things that are going through your mind. So what I do is I literally have a checklist for every single process. I have to do something more than, more than once, uh, I have a checklist for it. Like the research process, I have a checklist. Equipment setup, the settings on the camera, I have a checklist. And I'll share these slides with you guys at the end. There's actually a link that you guys can go to to download all these slides. And actually, I have a sample of, uh, of these checklists that you guys can use for yourself, too, um, So for all of these. So like editing, I have a checklist. Filming, I have a checklist. Uploading process, I have a checklist. So I highly recommend this because you miss something. So literally, even today, like I'm like, OK, I got to uh, set up my camera. And then for some reason, like, if I don't have on a checklist, I forget the basic stuff, like, oh, the remote, where's the remote? So the checklist really helps to, once again, the theme of streamlining the process. You don't want to be drained through the video filming and video production process. You want to try to streamline it as much as possible, and checklist helps to really optimize that. Yeah, so I'll send you the slides. If you click on this link, you can download those uh, sample checklists. All right, batch record videos. So this is another one of those things to help streamline. I uh, got in the habit of recording at least four or sometimes six videos in a day, so in a sitting. So I'm sitting there for like six hours, literally like filming one video after the other. And this is where the scripting comes really handy because all you're doing is executing. You did, you did all the thinking up front in the scripting portion. So all you're doing is really performing in front of the camera. So I have a setup. This is what my setup looks like. As you can see, I have my lighting, uh, I have my boom mic, I have my um, teleprompter and my camera. It's a lot of work, as you can tell. I'm sure you guys have experienced this. Setting this up once is a lot of work. So once you have a setup, once you have the lighting setup, I, I, I love to just record as much as possible, as long as you know um, I don't lose steam. And then you can tell here, this is uh, my schedule. Uh, I spend a lot of time on my hair, so I have a full 30 minutes. It's a very important part of my video production process. And then here, actually this day was short. I only filmed three because my son had a soccer practice later that day. But if uh, we didn't, then I would have literally filmed all the way throughout from like 10 a.m. till 4 p.m. with a little bit of lunch in between. But this really helps a lot because you're batch recording everything. And then if you're producing, if you're uh, publishing one video a week or two video a week, you're getting that lead time. At least, you know, like if, if you film four videos and you're publishing um, one a week, then now you have enough content for the month. So then you could start thinking about the next batch of content. But uh, batch recording really helps a lot. Teleprompter. 
some people might consider this cheating, but uh, like, just to give you an example, why teleprompter is so important? This just happens to me a lot. Like when I'm filming, camera's right here, the lighting's right here, I got my computer monitor right here, and then you're trying to, it's like you're a one-man production show, right? And then now I understand why, like in movies, they have like a guy with the boom mic, like literally the guy does, all he does is sound. And there's another guy that's like looking at the, the camera and there's like five different people behind the camera. I understand why. Because you're trying to make sure you're in focus. You're trying to make sure your you know, aperture is set up correctly. You're trying to make sure your sound is coming in. So then you're looking at like six different places and trying to make sure all these are correct. And then if you're trying to remember the script at the same time, it's like your brain's gonna go overload. So this is, you know, like this is what it looks like after, you know, you start filming, right? Like you're trying to like, like literally I'm like trying to look at the camera and I'm like looking over here, oh, aperture correct? Oh wait, sound? Oh wait, the light? Oh, it's too much, okay. You know, like you're trying to all these, do these different things. So like in order to really streamline that whole process, teleprompter really just kind of helps you to focus. Okay, all this is good. All I have to do is just read. And a lot of times because I did all the thinking up front, like I'm just performing what's on that script. Um, so just to give you exa guys examples, this is what I used. Um, this was a cheap one that I used initially. It's a $100 Padcaster Parrot. It comes with an app, uh, a free app, um, and then you just pop it right into your camera or DSLR camera. Uh, this is what I upgraded after I made some money uh, into a higher quality teleprompter. Um, so this one, ha you put it on its own um, tripod and then you put the camera right behind it, and then you can rest your, uh, your phone or your iPad in front of it. So highly recommend teleprompter, they're super helpful. All right, one film setup. This was another one I struggled with. So you know, you've seen YouTubers where they're filming in a lot of different, dif different locations, and you're like, wow, that's kind of cool, like the back, this, you know, this YouTuber was filming in this background, and then they switched to this background, like I should do that too. And for a little while, um, for a little while, you could tell here in this background, like I've changed locations multiple times. But what I noticed was the audience really didn't care. And I was just adding a bunch of work on my plate thinking I was being cool, but really the audience didn't care. They came to learn about, like I make a lot of video about index funds. They just want to learn about index funds. They could care less what my background looked like. And I was overcomplicating my process. So like, you know, I would, because this whole setup right here would take that setup that you saw earlier, the camera, the lighting, all of that, I had to like move all of that. And then for this setup, I had to move all of that. So every single time, it was just like, I had to, and when you're changing locations, your lighting changes. You have to make sure your camera, it's, the settings are different. All of it is just so much additional work. So what I did was, I got one good angle that I liked, and literally, for the last 100 videos, I'm like, I'm just gonna film in this one location. Um, and then it just, once again, streamlining the process. You're removing that friction. Because if you're thinking about, oh, how's this background going to look, then you're taking away energy that you should be spending on scripting content ideas, which is really the core of the video. So yeah, realized after 50 videos in, performance-wise, I actually looked at it, like no one cared. Like no one cared my background was cool. No one cared, you know, like you see those tech YouTubers, they have those like really cool lights in the back, no one cared. Yeah, it's a personal finance YouTube channel, no one cared, yeah. All right, Master Digital Asset Library. So this is another one of those, um, in order to streamline your video production process, um, uh, it's okay to reuse clips. I reuse a lot of my clips. Um, so what that means is like, if there's, I talk a lot about books. So I actually have just a digital library of all the books uh, that I use so that I can easily pull from them. So when you're editing videos, one of the friction is, hey, I need this clip, and then you spend 20 minutes going looking for that clip, downloading it, uploading it, right? So what you wanna do is try to remove that friction as much as possible by just having them in a library. So it can be on a Google Drive. Another way that's helped me was I actually have a separate, I use Final Cut Pro, I have a separate library where I pretty much uploaded all the clips that I uh, use regularly. So these are B-rolls. Or it could be B-rolls that you filmed. So just generic B-rolls of me typing behind the computer, hmm, me thinking like really deep, or me like looking up, like those kind of clips you can reuse over and over again as a B-roll. So then what I did was 
add them into a separate Final Cut Pro library, and then every time editing a video, and I come to a section where I'm like, oh, like, you know, I'm saying something about deep thoughts. Oh, it'd be nice to have B-roll of me thinking really deep. I'll have a clip of that, let me just pull that, instead of me thinking about, oh, I need to refilm all of this. And I realized no one really noticed that I was reusing this, because initially I was like, oh, like people are gonna notice that I'm using the same clips over and over again. And I realized it really didn't do anything to the, to the view, like no one really noticed. Um, it's the same face, you know, in different, it's like it's, people could care less. Um, so that really helps, once again, the theme of removing the friction um, of you having to take the time to go look for, that, uh, look for that digital asset, look for that clip, look for that picture, have them all in one place. If you know you talk a lot about, let's say, like books, for example, or like you talk about specific companies a lot, then download a bunch of those clips or images of that company, have them in a folder, so next time you're editing a video, you're not having to go to the web and download them again. You're just copying and pasting, copying and pasting, and then you're removing that friction of editing that video. Okay. All right, consistent style. This is another one of those things I have to learn in a hard way. You know, like you watch enough of these uh, YouTubers and you're like, oh, I gotta do like these fancy, jazzy styles, right? Um, change it up every time I make a video. And I realized once again, no one cared. Like they just want it, like they just want the information. People just want information. So I just kind of landed on, um, I use plugins where I landed on, this is a format that I like, it's clean, this is a design that I like, and I just reuse them over and over again throughout all of my videos. Um, and what this does is, once again, you come to a clip in your video when you're like, oh, I wanna show this, this kind of comparison. I wanna show two texts next to each other. I wanna show this graph. Instead of spending the time to go look for that graph, because that's another you know, like 20 minutes you have to spend, if you already have your design that you always follow, then you're literally just copying and pasting. And I realized once again, like, oh, what if like, people notice that this graph looks the same as the other graph? Like, no one cared. Like, people just wanted you know, you know, the 82%, that's all they cared about. So once again, you wanna remove that friction as much as possible in your process. And if you guys want recommendation on on some of the plugins that I use. I think they work with like other um, video editing software as well, but Motion VFX and then FX Factory, they've been pretty good. I think Motion VFX is probably one of the top tier ones. I don't know if there's any video editors in here that could say things better, but. Um, all right. Last tip, phased edit. Okay. Cut your goal in half, perfection, perfection in, Perfectionism always makes things harder and more complicated. Finishers make things easier and simpler. So in the theme of removing the friction, a lot of times we burn out, we lose steam, because the goal of editing this whole video, creating this whole video just seems so daunting. Uh, so with the edits, I, I remember running into this a lot. We're like, oh my goodness, like from scratch, audit to the final production, there's just so much that needs to happen. So what's really helped me was kind of chopping up the, pro the process of editing. So what I did was I broke it into four different phases. Initial cut, where I would just take the raw video and then cut it into the straight A roll. Um, phase two was where I would add like stock, the stock edits or the, uh, the stock edit was where I would add the um, those themes that you guys saw, the titles and such, the same ones, I'm just going through and just putting in those titles, uh, subtitles, quotes, and then core edit is where I would spend putting in B-rolls, infographics, and then the final review. So every process is different, but for me, I, I do this each one of these process uh, with like four or six videos at a time. So then uh, it just kind of, cuts down the individual editing process of video, so you're kind of you know, utilizing the economy of scale whenever you're doing a certain process. All right, the most important thing about art is to work. Nothing else matters except sitting down every day and trying. So for me, what's really worked is um, committing to that two videos a week. Um, and then with every single video that I try to upload, I focus more upon how do I make this next video 1% better than the previous video? 
how do I make the argument slightly better? How do I make my examples a little bit better? Um, how do I make the visuals slightly better? It wasn't trying to uh, make, you know, it's, I think what, what, we, what we get caught up is we're trying to compare ourselves to, you know, you've heard of this quote probably, our beginning to someone else's middle or someone else's end, right? Someone's been working on this for four or five years. It's not fair to compare ourselves to that person's five years in. So know that this is a iterative process. It's gonna take time. But then um, if you keep at it, if you focus on 1% better, uh, if you focus on the inputs, I feel like within you know, the YouTube world, the algorithm world, it does reward consistency. Uh, content is king. Mm -hmm. And if you guys want the slides, please go to this website, uh, the URL here and, the, here, and then you can download the full deck. And then there's also that link to those um, checklists that you guys can download. All right, how do I do in time? All right, we got 15 minutes left for Q&A. Yes? So I know you can sort of sort of get a lavalier mic on. Yes. Boom mic or, or both? Okay, so the question was some of them, I have a lav mic. I did a lav mic or boom mic. So I've done both. So I've done lav mic initially. Uh, I transitioned to boom mic uh, maybe about six months ago. Um, Boom mic initially for me was intimidating because I had to record the audio separately. And then I was trying to remove uh, the friction in which I needed to do post-production work. So I did a lav mic that hooked up directly to the camera. Um, and then when you download the media, it has both the audio and the, uh, uh, the video in there. But I would say after using the boom mic, the sound is better with the boom mic. I could see why in you know, Hollywood movies they have those guys that are standing there with the boom mics. Yeah, so, yes. Yeah, so I would say uh, when people talk about equipment-wise, um, the most important equipment initially is actually the sound. So then you could film with your phone, but either you get a separate recorder or a lav mic. So there are um, adapters that you can hook up into your phone, but uh, a lav mic was really helpful just because, you know, you've heard, you might have heard the saying, people can watch a bad quality video, but they can't watch bad uh, quality audio. So I would say like lot, people are a lot more forgiving with your video quality. And nowadays with the, like iPhones, you can't really tell the difference too much between um, I would say like cheaper DSLR camera, mirrorless DSLR cameras versus an iPhone. But then I would recommend thinking about a, a good, um, good audio setup. Yeah, yes. Yeah, so this is uh, from Stephen King. If you want to be a good writer, you got to read, read a lot and write a lot. So this was one other thing that kind of surprised me was I thought I would spend more time on the video portion. I think I realized I'm spending more time reading and writing. Like literally, like that's where I get blog posts, books from people that are way smarter than me. And then I think what, what I'm trying to do is as I'm reading different types of books, um, you know, you're just kind of correlating a lot of these ideas in your own head. But yeah, like just reading and reading a lot. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So initially, this is uh, you know, there's a lot of videos regarding like tricks, right? Like the first second of the the video matters a lot, um, and then you gotta add suspense throughout the videos. I'm not sure, like, I think there is time and place for that. So I think, like, if you're a Mr. Beast and you're catering to a bunch of 80-year-olds, maybe. What I realized was the videos that performed really well for me was ones where, like, surprisingly, I would delve super deep into, like, uh, I take one index fund and I would delve deep into it. And I thought, like, who's going to want to watch this thing? I'm literally reading the, you know, the fund uh, prospects on, you know, uh, and I'm just going through them in detail. But if people need that information, they stay with it. 
So I think at the end of the day, I think it comes down to it's not the trips, it's not the tricks, it's not the, you know, the jazzy, you know, like trying to keep people's attention. I think if you're providing really quality content that is usable and actionable, I think that itself keeps people's attention. Yes. Yeah, it was all organic. Yeah, so I would say the way I saw the curve uh, kind of move up was up until, so la I'll give you some context. Two years ago, I uh, had 35, 25 subscribers you guys saw. Last year, when I was sitting right there, I had 3,000 subscribers. I remember coming to FinCon last year. And then uh, within a period of six months, it went from 3,000 to almost 100,000. But it was about 150 videos in. So at that moment, I had 150 videos in. So what happened was when a couple of the videos started picking up, all the other previous content started to pick up with it. So that kind of had that momentum. So I feel like if I didn't have those 150 videos that I, I've worked on, then I could have had a spur, but it would have gone, gone back down. And that happened to me before. Yeah. Yes. I did a little bit. I did use AI tools uh, to, like ChatGPT. There were some other ones like Jasper that I used, um, but not as kind of the. It was more of like a supplement. So like when I'm when I'm writing a script, and I hit a like a roadblock on like okay like um, frugality tips. Um, and I just want some idea generation, then you can just type it in there and it gives me some ideas. But I use it maybe just in those contexts, not really to like write out the script for me, but more just to kind of spur my thoughts. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so it's a combination. So initially it's ad revenue. So that's the nice thing about YouTube long form videos is that I feel like compared to a lot of the other platforms, the ad revenue is pretty high, especially if you're talking about personal finance. Um, so that is a huge motivator of keeping you in there. So ad revenue is one, but uh, you know, like what all the other content, content creators are doing, affiliates, brand sponsorships. Uh, I do some uh, money coaching on the side. Um, and then, yeah, I think some of the other creators, they go into like, you know, course creation, but yeah. But ad revenue is, it is, it is nice, yeah. Yes. How often are you checking like your analytics on your videos? Because I know most of the YouTube talk about, a lot of the YouTubers talk about like watching your analytics and like watching your retention time. Yeah. Or like watching your spikes in a video mm -hmm. or like things that drops in yeah, a video yeah. to be able to cut that kind of stuff out. Like how often do you do stuff like that to help improve your videos? Yeah. 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 So I think there is validity to that. I would say the two biggest indicators I look at is the click-through rate and the watch time. So uh, click-through rate just shows is the thumbnail and the title. Does that? It's like you know going on Netflix, right? And then like there could be a great movie, but if the if the movie poster is not that great, you're not going to click on it. So I think I do spend some time looking at the thumbnails and the titles to make sure the click-through rate is high. If it's lower than what I'm used to getting, then I re rethink about uploading. But then the watch time is the other part where I, is that tells me most, uh, gives me the most direct feedback, is this quality content? Is this something that people are really interested in? But I don't go into depth of what like Mr. Beast does and look at like little micro, you know, like I mean, he's getting like 20 million views per, you know, you yeah. Yeah, so I think that helps to inform your future videos. So what I do is, uh, that's a good point. I look at my videos that are performing well or videos that didn't perform well, and that helps me to inform my future content. So for example, let's say like I made a video about um, like frugality uh, and then that one did really well. So it helps me to spur, okay, let me think about new future frugality videos. But there was some videos that I thought, oh, real estate, let me do, do a video about like real estate terms. And then that one flopped. 
So I'm like, okay, like this is not something that I, I should delve into. So I think it helps to inform my future content ideas. Yeah. Yes. I haven't personally tried YouTube Shorts. I'm a little wary of it right now because um, I feel like you also want to think about the, so then the audience that I think comes to my channel are used to the long form, 10 to 15 minute videos that are very informative. I feel like Shorts have a place, my concern is it might attract not the audience that I'm looking for, but once again, I mean, it's so, it's so new right now, uh, but I have personally haven't tried it yet. Yeah. Yes, in the back. Um, so I think for me, it comes down to um, being able to articulate the content in a way uh, that people can digest and relate to. So how do I, uh, so right now, like there's, a w there's easy ways to talk about my favorite index fund. My favorite index fund is this because the performance is this and performance is that, right? But then I feel like where there's opportunities that I've seen other content creators do is they take a very boring topic and they're able to articulate it into a story or be able to narrate it in a way that it's digestible for people. It's not just, you know, like, here, look at these slides. Look at, let me go through this chart. It's more of like, how do you make this more relatable? So I think, you know, it's, like, it's, it's all visual content, right? It's about when someone looks at it, do they walk away from it? Like, that was a really good piece of content. Like, that would, had a combination of, like, information, entertainment, storytelling, all of those things. But I think that's also the hardest Right? Because it's easy to spew out five things about this index funds. How do I make this into something that is relatable, interesting, funny at the same time? Now that's the creative part of our brain that we have to really push up. And that's where kind of, uh, um, what do you call it? Coach Carson's question regarding like, how do you write better? It's like, read a lot, write a lot. And I think that, that creative endeavor only comes when you're doing a lot more of that. Yeah. Yes, out in the back. Uh, I outsource the edits now, but then with the edits, probably like 10 to 15 hours, yeah, per video. Yeah, so you can think of 10, 15 minute video, it takes about 10 to 15 hours, yeah. <laughs> no, I did, uh, I use a, like a video editing subscription um, service, but I am looking for a new editor, so if anybody knows, please, yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's auto in the back. Uh, so the question was, am I using any other social media traffic channel? I'm not. Um, I've been, what I've been doing is YouTube as the core traffic channel, and I'm actually driving people towards my email list from there. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I am thinking through um, other social media channels, but it, this is why I need a new editor. So, yeah. Yes. Yeah, so kind of batching is uh, my theme in order to minimize the friction of changing, switching tasks. So yeah, like when I go into writing mode, I think I'm, I'm like writing like six scripts at a time. Yeah. Yeah, like two a day, one a day. And then like these ideas, I feel like most of the, it's kind of like a movie, right? The movie is made in the script. It's like you can't take a bad script and then make it into a good movie in the editing process. So I feel like the video is already made up front. So this is where I spend majority of my, I would say like brain energy is on the scripting part of thinking of ideas on the best script, coming up with the resources, quotes, uh, data that I can back it up with. And that's where I spend majority of my time. Once the script is written, everything else is just mechanics. You're filming, you're editing, you're just going through the process. There's no part in that process where you're making the video any better. 
Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so it's a, it's a little bit of a mix. Um, I would say I do less trending. Um, and then try to focus more upon um, original idea, but that's hard. I mean, I think it's a little bit of kind of uh, initially when you're trying to form your own original idea. So like I would say like, you know, channel is called Financial Tortoise. So you think it would be intuitive that I started with Slow and Steady? It wasn't that. I don't know why I chose Tortoise. I just like chose it. And then, like, I didn't, and then it was only, like, 50 videos in. I was like, oh, it's tortoise, tortoise in the hair. I should do the whole slow and steady thing. And then that's when I started to, like, market a little bit more. And then I think around that theme, I try to come up with more original ideas around that brand. But initially, it was just a lot of copying and trying different things. Uh, yeah, like, there's a bunch of videos about, like, five best millionaire habits, right? Like, or... 10 things I never buy. Like you see all the personal finance YouTubers making those videos. So I made all those initially to just kind of, you know, get the muscle working. But then I think as you create more videos, more scripts, this is where that you're, you start to form your own viewpoints, your own ideas, your own way of kind of, your own angle of looking at things. Um, yeah, so I mean, I think it's a combination, but I feel like down the line, you want to get to a point where you're creating your own original idea, not following the trend. Yeah. Filming or? Yeah. Yeah. So once again, I think. Uh, the what I would focus upon isn't the like the setup of the location of shooting, but rather is the idea generation. Because whether you're on the road, you could always be writing, you could always be scripting, um, and then I think once you have a stable spot in which you could film, once you have all those video ideas ready, then you can film. If you're in a like if you're in one place for a day, then you can film like eight videos in that one location. But really, all the work is done beforehand. Like, you know, why you're on the road. Yeah. Yes, auto in the back. Yeah. Yeah, yeah so I think that's important. So I, I don't have any video editing skills. My previous job, I was, a, I was a finance director. I'd never touched the editing. I never even filmed myself until I started this process. Um, so I think it's good to do it and to your part of uh, uh, to your point regarding learning how to do it, so I didn't outsource until 150 videos in, yeah. Um, but then at that point, I think uh, I knew like how to edit uh, almost or better than a lot of the editors out there. So now this is where I think I can push the editors, saying like when. So right now, when they come back with me, I'm like like I could do this. Like I'm looking for someone who can take me to the next level. Um, but I think it's important to kind of learn that or else, you know, it's like, uh, it's not, not, not with everything, you know, that you have to learn on your own. But if you think about in the YouTube world, that video is your final product. That video is kind of like your book, your product that you're creating. So you want that final product to look the best as possible. And I feel like no one else is going to care as much as you're going to in that final product. Yeah. Sorry. I think we can do two more questions. Yes. Yeah, so initially it's hard, right? Because the, the writing part um, already is hard enough. So I think what's helped me was this is where you, you need to get the reps in. I think once, when you're initially writing, it's already hard enough to get the idea on paper, but then once you get into it, then, and you create more videos, then you start to visualize, oh, okay, when I'm, ta when I'm saying this, these kind of visuals will help a lot. So I think it comes with practice, um, but it's a, uh, what do you call it? Um, yeah, it's something that you definitely, I think, wanna do. All right, I think we have one more question. Anybody? Yes. Yeah. 
Yeah, so what I've done is uh, um, videos that are a little bit more technical. What I, would, what I do is I have a lead generator that goes along with it. So like I recently made a video about like 10 best Vanguard funds, but they're very technical. It goes into like the nuances of expense ratios and returns. So I, I, what I said was, hey, you want to follow along? Uh, go and download this PDF guide that lists out all of these funds and all the details. And then, you know, everybody who's watching that, vi who came to watch, a v if they're motivated to watch a video about Vanguard funds, like they're trying to learn. So then they're going to go and download that, uh, that lead generator. So those have converted the best versus I also make videos about kind of general like habits and frugality. Um, those haven't converted as well. Awesome. Well, thank you guys so much for coming.